Hare Krishna, Madhavan Thru, Amarindra Thru, humble obeisances. Thank you once again for joining for the Monk's podcast. We continue our Gopi Gita discussion. Madhavan Thru, would you like to begin with the invocation prayers? Narayanam namaskritcham naram shavanarotamam Devim sadasvatim vyasam tato jayam durayat Vedi Ramayane shaiva purane bharate tata Adavante chamadye chahari sabatu giyate Mukam karodi vacha lampangum langayate girim Yet kripa tamaham vande shri gurum dinatadanam Paramananda Madhavam Paramananda He Madhava Padunga Luchi Makaranda Se Makaranda Panakori Anande Bolo Hari Hari Harika Name Vandavela Parikori Be Chakadola Se chaka do langa paraye manamo rahu nirantare manamo nirantare rahu ha krishna boli jiva jao ha krishna boli jao jiva mote udara radha dava mote Dharadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhadhad
here there's a lot of a description about the hand and it seems to be very it's somewhat like a aishwarya mood they say narsimha dev places his hands on the head of prahlad so the gopi is saying place your hand on our head so, yes adan pro you would like to speak something yeah this subject is very very I, this verse i find very very interesting because as you just pointed out it seems to me perhaps a little confusing it seems a little different than the previous verses that we looked at because here uh, some stress is being given that yes krishna if you put your hand on our head then it'll give fearlessness it will become free some streets here by it will become free from the fear of material existence and they're stressing the putting a hand on the head and uh a very very interesting point so uh, we can say so many things about that one thing it reminds me of is, is being here in mayapur once I, i went to the ganga to take bath in the morning and uh, when i went to the ganga i saw there was a uh, a a man and wife with their small child and they're getting ready to take bath and the child before taking bath went and offered a basinsu to the mother and father and the father and mother put their hands on the child's head and that's our culture we want that ashirvad but as you're pointing out chaitanya charan prabhu that that kind of ashirvad that's uh, that seems like it's very much an ashvarya and and indeed in this verse it, it's it's being said that shri kala brahma that, that shri this is for lakshmi devi that this hand goes on the head of lakshmi devi so some questions that i i would like to personally look at is how is it that we that the gopis are praying like this why, why are they praying for fearlessness we we hear in the first canto of the bhagavatam that that one of the external symptoms of hearing bhagavatam is shoka moha bayapaha that all types of fear lamentation and illusion go away so there's something more to it here in vishnu and excuse me in narahari chakravarti takur's uh, bhakti vidnakar he gives a prana mantra that the gopis recite to lord shiva which it, this verse today reminds me a little of that and they pray to lord shiva shriman gopishwaram vande shankaram karuna mayam sarva klesha haram devam bindarani ruti padam they're playing to lord shiva the sarva klesha haram devam you're the deva who takes away hara all types of klesha all types of suffering so on one level that then we someone may say well this is a nice pair because i have lots of suffering and the gopis they're also suffering maybe they don't have enough to eat or maybe it's too cold for them and therefore they're they're praying to lord shiva please take away this cold <laughs> please give us something to eat we may pray in that kind of mood but that's not the mood of the braj gopikas what is the mood of the braj gopikas when when they say here sarva klesha haram devam in this prayer from bhakti ratnakar to lord shiva they're not praying for our type of, of removal of suffering rather their suffering is they want to see krishna they're suffering because they can't see krishna and this is their prayer to lord shiva so this verse can be taken in many different ways and our acharyas they speak about it in a number of different ways i'd like to hear something from uh, amarender prabhu but uh, i'd like to to later on discuss a little bit from a verse in the fifth canto of the bhagavatam where lakshmi devi is speaking about having the hand of the lord on her head and some of the different comments that our acharyas give about that so this verse again is is we've been discussing in all of our previous sessions can be understood in different ways but we'd like to understand it in the mood of the gopis and in particular in the mood of the left wing gopis of the followers of shrimati radharani so this is my uh, preliminary thoughts on this verse today thank you yes yes some other to like to reflect on that or anything more sure project so actually um just to see the verse in the context of the previous verses uh shila vishwana chakravarti thakur writes how this verse actually fits in in the flow of the discussion till now chakravarti pad writes that the so if you see till now the second verse the gopis have been criticizing krishna to be a murderer ne hakim vada and in the third verse they talk about uh, how krishna has been a betrayer he has been uh, a sabotager trying to be from their camp but actually um you know not being from their camp because 
what we see in the in the second verse we see that the gopis are saying neha kim vada isn't this murder and the third verse they say you protected us from uh, the poisonous water of kaliya and you protected us from akasura you protected us during the govardhan leela you protected us from arishtasura and vatsasura and vyomasura and now when we gain our uh, faith and trust we we in, invest our trust and faith in you you have betrayed us so in the second verse krishna is being called as a killer a murderer and in the third verse he's been called as a betrayer so in the spurti in the heart of the gopis they hear krishna say that if you think i'm a killer if you think i'm a betrayer if you speak like this i will never come out <laughs> i will never give you darshan so then the gopis change their strategy from the fourth verse onwards they start glorifying him so that he comes back <laughs> therefore in the fourth verse we see na khalu gopika nandano bhavan akhila dehi naam antaratmadrik oh oh you're not just the son of gopika um, mother yashoda you're actually the super soul and brahma ji prayed for your appearance so that krishna uh, is satisfied with that glorification and actually there also we discussed how there are two camps the dakshinya and the vamya drishtikon the perspective from the left wing and the right wing and hearing the fourth verse krishna said oh now i am very happy after criticizing me in verse 2 and verse 3 after calling me a murderer and calling me a betrayer in verse 4 you have glorified me very nicely but left wing camp says that no we were actually even we were even in the in the fourth verse we criticized you but it's just that we decorated it so nicely it externally seems as glorification but actually we still are speaking our words of criticism so krishna says oh actually your words of criticism are sweeter than your words of glorification all of you are so expert in speaking i am very satisfied and therefore when i am happy i would like to give you a boon ask for whatever you want so in the fifth verse the gopis say the only thing that we want is you please place your hand on our head so when krishna is happy to give a boon the boon is always given as a blessing on the head of the recipient so this verse falls in the context of the heart to heart conversation between uh, the gopis and shri krishna and shri lashridhar swami in his bhavartha dipika commentary he has mentioned how four verses starting from this one fifth sixth seventh and eighth they are actually four verses of prayers the gopis are till now they were asking for the darshan of krishna krishna you appear but now in the next four verses we could say they are like the chatush shloki of the of the shri of the gopi geet 5 6 7 and 8 not like the seed verses but back to back four verses of prayers where the gopis are expressing their heart and asking for a benediction shri lashridhar swami says this is an interesting point we can see even in this verse like the other verses that we have discussed in the past uh, the first syllable and the seventh syllable remains the same except for the second line you can see the last line shirasi starts with a sh and after the pause the seventh syllable is shri karagraham so shirasi dehi nah pause shri karagraham so sh a shirasi and sh as shri kara and in the third line kara saroruham starting with a k and after the pause again k kanta kamadam and first line is virachita bhayam starting with a v and after the pause vrishni dhuryate but the second line we see it is charanam yusham starting with a ch and after the pause it is samshrutair bhayat so uh, shri pad vallabhacharya ji in his shri subodhini tika he says uh, a replacement for charanam could be sharanam <laughs> so in that way what happens is um, virachita bhayam vrishni dhuryate so it's the v which is consistent and then instead of charanam if the alternative reading could be sharanam sharanam iyusham then some sritair bhayat would again poetically match with the s before and after the pause uh, so in that way all the lines are poetically so beautifully aligned and as we previously mentioned the second syllable remains the same veera chita bhayam it is ra charanam iyusham karasaroruham shirasi dehina so these were some uh, poetic um, standouts for the verse apart from the comments from shila vishwana chakravarti thakur shripad vallabhacharya ji and shila shridhar swami 
So I will I will pause at that for now. Okay. See, uh, regarding this verse, you know, the Shri Karagraham, there is this, uh, throughout the Bhag- 10th canto, there are glimpses when the, whoever is offering prayers, they sometimes talk about Krishna's divinity, the Aishwarya Bhav. But then it is quickly overshadowed. So even when Yashodamai sees the universal form of Krishna with his mouth, she initially becomes bewildered, then she becomes reverential, and then she again starts, she forgets that. So there are some glimpses of Krishna's divinity coming up coming up uh, intermittently. But I was thinking that there is no place, other place in, in the 10th canto where the Vrajivasis themselves are offering prayers to Krishna. Isn't it? In Vrindavan, there's Brahmaji offering prayers, Indra offering prayers, but we don't see the Gopas or Anand Maharaja Rishoda, anyone else, his Krishna's Gopa friends. Does anyone else offer prayers to Krishna directly so that the tension of uh, Aishwarya and uh, Madhurya from the Vrajvasi perspective can be seen? It's interesting in the Bhagavatam, both in the meeting of Kurukshetra and here in, in the Gopi Gita and a few other places we find the gopis apparently offering prayers to Krishna. And indeed, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Puri, he recites some of those verses uh, that the gopis were reciting in the meeting of Kurukshetra. But what is the nature of those things? In, in uh, uh, Srila Jiva Goswami's Gopal Champu, there's an interesting discussion about the 47th chapter, the 10th canto, and Radharani, she's chastising this bumblebee. And she's saying, you're such a badmash, you're a drunkard, you're this or that. And then the bumblebee starts flying away. And then Radharani, she becomes disturbed. She thinks, oh, what have I done? I've committed some offense to this bumblebee. And then she starts speaking in a very sweet way to the bumblebee. So as Amarendra Prabhu was uh, pointing out, the gopis, they're speaking in a sweet way because there's this discussion going on on a subtle level with Krishna. There's some spurti, and Krishna's saying, oh, you don't, you're angry with me, you're not happy with me, then I'll go. And then the gopis say, no, 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 no. <laughs> and they start speaking in a sweet kind of way. So there's a technical phrase for that, which Bhaktivinoda Thakur speaks about in Gita Mala and Archaris in different places. And that, that kind of lady, she's a Kalahantarita uh, Naika. The Kalahantarita, Bhaktivinoda Thakur defines as Manera Kalahari Jana Chali Dukha Kori Kalahantarita Santapani. That the nature of this heroine is that when there's some quarrel with Krishna, and that quarrel comes from Man. Man is one of the four different types of separation between the lover and the beloved. But after that man takes place, then the heroine, who she chastises Krishna, you go away, get out of here, I don't want to see you. She sends him away. And then <laughs> Santapini, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, she starts lamenting. She becomes even more bereaved. What did I do? I made this mistake. Why did I, why did I send him away? So this phrase is an interesting phrase, Kala Hantarita. The word Kala, has all of these words have a number of different meanings. This is a compound word, kalahantarita. Kala means to speak in a soft way. And kalaha means to quarrel or abuse someone. Kalaha is a woman. Women by nature, as Bhaktivinoda, as, uh, excuse me, Rupa Goswami says in Ujjwa Milo Mani, when he speaks about man, or loving sulkiness, and it's an important thing for us to understand. This is not just some rusty kind of things. We can't understand the gopis, we can't understand these verses unless we understand something about the nature of man. So the nature of man, like Rupa Goswami says, is two types of man, hoitaki man and ahoitaki man, or anger, sulkiness with a cause and anger or sulkiness without a cause. Sometimes Krishna goes to see some other gopis and he comes before Radharani, he has some makeup on his face or something from those other gopis or he comes late and Radharani has a cause for her anger and she chastises Krishna. 
But other times there's anger with no cause. Ahoy man. Sometimes Krishna says, Oh Radhika, your face is just like the moon. And he's glorifying Radha. But Radharani becomes angry. She says, what do you mean? The moon has so many pockmarks on it. What are you saying about me? But that's anger without a cause. So one of the synonyms for Sri or for woman is Kalaha. Uh, and Kalaha means someone who gently chastises or abuses a man. So I like to point out sometimes, that, especially if you're husband men, that God gave women the right to be angry even for no reason. <laughs> and so the Kalahantarita, Nayika, this heroine, it's a little bit of a technical thing, but it's a very uh, relevant for our discussion today. She's Kalaha, she's a woman who's chastising in a soft way, but Tarita, she uses a forefinger, this particular finger. And this finger in Sanskrit, in Ayurvedic medicine, is called Bish Angu. Angu means a finger, and Bish means poison. This is a poisonous finger. In an Ayurvedic medicine, you're not supposed to make the medicine or take the medicine with this finger. In our, in our japa, we keep this finger outside of our bead bag because this is a bishangu. The bishangu is that finger which we use to chastise. So tarita is a synonym of bishangu. Tarita means that, that this uh, kalahan tarita, this woman, she's chastising with this finger. But then the word hanta has a few meanings too. Hanta means grief that then she begins to lament, oh, what did I do? I sent Krishna away, I chastised Krishna, this is very, very bad. There are five different prominent characteristics of the Kalahantarita Naika. One is that, that uh, and this Radharani has these symptoms, she, she chastises Krishna, Krishna comes and he says, no, I, this and that happened, I, I wasn't able to come because I overslept, my alarm didn't go off or whatever. And Radharani is just very scornful of everything that he says, all of his explanations. And she considers it just to be some cunning trickery. That's the first symptom. And the second symptom of the Kalahantarita Nayika, Radha, is that she, in her heart, she starts criticizing Krishna's behavior. And then she starts making different allegations against him out of anger. And the third symptom is that Krishna then, he, he reciprocates, he starts offering obeisances and, and begging forgiveness for Radha, from Radharani. And then Radharani becomes more and more obstinate. Fourth symptom is that then she, as her anguish gets further and deeper and deeper, she starts thinking about all the, the bad things that Krishna's done in her imagination. And then she becomes completely overwhelmed and she starts thinking about Krishna and no one else. So this is the nature of Radharani's love, the nature of the gopis' love. They chastise Krishna and just as Jiva Goswami in his Gopal Champu, he discusses how when the bumblebee came in the Brahma Ragit, and, and Radharani started speaking ill of that bumblebee and saying, look, as I see on, on your whiskers, there's some kum kum. This means that, that, that you, were, you were on the garland of Krishna and Krishna had been embracing some gopis and he got some kum kum from their body on that garland. And therefore you've gotten this and you're a rascal and your master's a rascal. And Radharani speaking like this in her mind. And then suddenly the bumblebee starts going away. And then Radharani becomes disturbed. She thinks in the mood of this Kalahantarita Naika, she thinks, oh, what have I done? Hanta means to lament. She starts lamenting. I sent Krishna away. This is very, very wrong. And then the gopis begin to offer prayers. But to understand those prayers, they're not like prayers which are offered by Gajendra, they're not prayers which are like are offered by the residents of Mathura, Dwarka, or any other place. These are prayers, as Chaitanya Charanpur, you're pointing out in Braj, we don't see the Vrijabhasis offering prayers, but the gopis sometimes offer prayers. So how do we understand that those prayers are a manifestation of their man? And that's, that's the mood of the Kalahantarita Naika. So, so many things can be said about that. I, I, I should stop there and see what uh, reflections the two of you have on that. I'm sorry, it's a very technical thing. But if we don't understand some of these points, and Srila Prabhupada discusses these things also in Chaitanya Charitamrita, in Madhya Leela chapter 15, there's some discussion given about the Harapanchami festival. And, and there's a long discussion about man. If we don't understand these things, then how can we understand the mood of the gopis? How can we understand the purport of these verses? 
Otherwise, just externally, it seems that the gopis are offering prayers and they're saying, please take away our, our material problems. <laughs> it, it's, it's not the fact. It's amazing. You know, it's uh, striking how something technical, when explained in the devotional context, can also become so relishable. Nicely put. Thank you, bro. Amarinder Prabhu. Anything? So, uh, sure, Prabhuji. I yeah, it was just so beautiful. Shripad Madhavananda Prabhu's uh, Kala Hantarita. <laughs> Very nice. I really liked it. Um, the Gopi who's um, quarreling with Krishna and has man and is chastising Krishna with her forefinger and at the same time has lament. So very nice. I really liked it. Yeah, actually, as far as um, this verse is concerned uh, that we are discussing uh, and we are we're speaking about the mood of prayers um, and whether, whether in Vrindavan there are prayers, my mind goes to the 19th chapter of the 10th canto where amidst the forest fire, the uh, the friends offer prayers. Krishna, Krishna, Mahavira, He Rama, Moha, Vikrama. Um, that, O oh, Shri Krishna, O oh, Shri Balaram, Davagnina Dahiyamana, we are being scorched by the heat of the forest fire. O oh, Krishna, O oh, Balaram, please protect us. So there are some prayers there. Um, also, Nagapatnis, technically they are also Brijbasis. But I think they will be considered as those in the mood of Aishwarya because they are devotees in, in uh, Dasirati as servitude. But they have also offered prayers in the 16th chapter of the 10th canto, going from text 33 to 53. Um, and we see even outside Brindavan, uh, even exalted Mahabhagavad Vaishnava is offering prayers. Um, in the 11th canto, we see Uddhava offering very sweet prayers. Um, very, very beautifully he has said. Tapatrayena abhihatasya ghore. O Krishna, tapatrayena abhihatasya. I am being scorched by the threefold miseries of life. And santapyamanam, I am really distressed. By what? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm distressed by this Kora, this very horrifying, fierce, intense material world. Isha, my Lord, mm, this is my situation here. Bhavad Vanisha, in this Bhava Advani, in this path of this material existence, I am being scorched. And Pashyami na Anya Charanam Tavangrim, apart from your two lotus feet, my Lord, I don't see any other source of shelter. But your lotus feet, how are they? Dwandva Atapatrat Amrita Bhivarishat. The heat of distress from outside can be protected by an umbrella. So your lotus feet are the umbrella which protect us from the heat of distress outside. But it's a very interesting umbrella. It protects us from the heat of distress. And inside the umbrella, there is a rain of happiness. <laughs> so Atapatrat Amrita Abhivarishat. That Krishna, your two lotus feet, protect us from the scorching heat of distress as an umbrella. But it adds an extra flavor under the umbrella of your lotus feet. There are raindrops of nectar in happiness. So actually speaking, Uddhava is not being scorched by the threefold miseries of life. He's not. Why would he say that? Why would he say that? And similarly, we find Srila Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur in um, uh, Vrinda Devi Ashtakam. Bhaktya vihina aparada lakshe kripta shakamadita ranga madhye kripa mai tvam sharanam prapanna vrinde namaste charanaravindam. Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur has said, My Lord, what is my situation? Bhaktya vihina aparada lakshe. I am devoid of devotion, and my only intention is to commit aparad. <laughs> <laughs> to offenses. And Kshiptascha Kamadi Taranga Madhyay. And I am fallen in the waves of lusty desires. Kripa Mai, O Vrinda Devi, O Tulsi Maharani. Kripa Mai, O Ocean of Mercy. Tvam Sharanam Prapanna. Please, I, I approach your lotus feet. Please give me shelter. Vrinde Namaste Charanaravindam. O Tulsi Devi, O Vrinda Devi. I bow down to you. So question could be asked. In the first example, is Uddhava actually tormented by the threefold miseries? 
In the second example is Srila Vishuna Chakravarti Thakur actually devoid of devotion and intentionally committing offenses and thrown in the waves of lust. The answer is no. A conditioned soul prays to the Supreme Lord because that is his reality. When a conditioned soul says that I'm scorched by the threefold miseries, that's a reality. When a conditioned soul says that I am thrown in the waves of lust, that's a reality. But when great Vaishnavas like Uddhava or Srila Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur or the gopis in this case, where they say that, oh my Lord, anyone who takes shelter of your lotus feet is freed from suffering and fear. In that mood, we take shelter of your lotus feet. The question could be, are they actually fearful? Do they have any fear of material existence? The answer is no. <laughs> the answer is no. They absolutely have no fear. Then why are they speaking like this? Why is Uddhava offering prayers like that? Why is Srila Sanatan Goswami saying, my Lord, Ke ami kene amar jade tapatroi, iha nahi jani prabhu kemani hito hoi. That my lord, I don't know who I am. I don't know why I'm being scorched by the threefold miseries. People glorify me as a scholar, and my problem is I believe them. So he's speaking, it seems like a, in a self deprecating manner. Kaviraj Goswami speaks, Jay Mora nam shunetara punyak choi. Anybody who hears my name, they will fall from their spiritual standing. Why are the Acharyas speaking like this? Why are they offering prayers? Very different from a conditioned soul. Conditioned soul is speaking in honesty. And liberated, pure Vaishnavas, Nitya Siddha, Mahabhagavat, the eternally perfected beings, are offering prayers in humility. They are able to see themselves in a situation that they are not in. It's like transcendental hallucination. It's on the other side of the spectrum. A conditioned soul, he realizes his position and he offers prayers. And pure Vaishnavas, they are beyond it. But in their humility, they feel there's need for me to take shelter because I'm, I'm in that situation. So sometimes we see uh, pure Vaishnavas also offering prayers in that mood. Although they don't need it, but Jana Samanya for Loka Shiksha, for teaching everyone how to take shelter. So this, this verse is beautiful in that way. It's, it's like Krishna's pastimes have this aspect of some, are, some of them are to be imitated. Some of them are to be, we take inspiration from them, but we're not meant to imitate them. So it seems even with the prayers of the devotees, we have to look at oh, when they are actually taking the, taking the role of a sadhaka for our sake. When Prahlad Maharaj, at one place he says that... Um, that I am being like a soul person who is being pulled by different wives in different directions. So, <clears throat> but then the next verse he's praying that I have no, not next verse, a few verses later he's praying that I have no fear of material existence because I am simply Tadvirya Gaya and Mahamrita Magna Chittaha. So I'm completely absorbed in your glories, in relishing your glories. So it does seem that this dynamic, like it is there Throughout the Bhagavatam also, where sometimes the great souls place themselves in the position of sadhakas or conditioned souls to teach us how to how we can approach the Lord. So with respect to the gopis, there is this, um, especially since we are talking about Uddhava and the gopis, the, the gopis here at one level, they are, they are experiencing intense separation from Krishna and they are using, you could say, using or utilizing every means to beseech Krishna to come back. And one of them, we could say is also that, yes, if you are the supreme divinity, if you are Vishnu, then you should protect us from distress. So even if you don't acknowledge that we have that intimate relationship. This is basically like human decency or just your not necessarily intimate relationship, but the divine. If God is there and somebody prays to God, God protects them. So you are the Lord of the goddess of fortune. We are in misfortune. So, oh, Vrishni Dhuryate, oh, hero, oh, Lord, please protect us. So the gopis in their mood, it's like, we could say almost like Yukta Vairagya. If or, like we use the material in the service of Krishna in the mood of renunciation, the gopis sometimes use Krishna's divinity to further their intimate relationship with him. 
and their, their focus is not so much on that divinity of krishna but okay if this can help us come closer to krishna then even this can be this can be used just like the gopis pray to vishnu please tell us where is krishna and their idea is that yes vishnu is there we want to go to krishna so if vishnu can help us then let me go toward krishna also let let us let us that help us go toward krishna is any thoughts on this madan through amendu or yeah i was it's it's a manifestation of the dynamia but it's not just only dynamia there's also a very very intense love and the gopis they're not as we're pointing out again and again the gopis here they're not praying for something for themselves but these prayers are a manifestation of their love for krishna and what's happened is that they 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 were chastising krishna in their sulkiness and then in their spurti in their mind that they in their heart they saw oh krishna now he's left krishna says okay you don't want me then i'll go and then the gopis they they manifest this, this humility and they start praying but that humility is a very different kind of humility from the humility of uddhava or other devotees the braj gopi because their humility is a manifestation of their ecstatic love for krishna they want to please krishna by that and that's one reason why also i find it very astonishing swoop damodar goswami and chaitanya mahaprabhu find it very astonishing the sulkiness of lakshmi devi which is mentioned in madhya the chapter 15 14 and gives and the hera panchami in odia language panchami means a fifth it's a fifth day and hera means to see So on that day, Lakshmi Devi she becomes angry. Sri Damodar Goswami says we've never seen any kind of anger like this. So we were hearing in the previous verses in this thirty-first chapter how the gopis are chastising Krishna, but now all of a sudden they they they, they thought oh we've done something wrong please forgive us, which is a manifestation of, of their ecstatic love. We see that also in the eighty-second chapter of the tenth canto, the famous verse. which is recited by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Jagannath Puri also with the gopis and this verse is very interesting in 87th chapter of the 10th canto this is the only verse spoken by the gopis to krishna the gopis have seen krishna so many many years and then they come together and they only have one verse to say what does that mean the gopis they say ahus chate nalina naba padada vinda Yogeshvarai hudi vichincha magada bodai Samsara kupa pati tota ranava lambam ge ham jusam Apimanas yudiyat sadanaha And Jiva Goswami in Priti Sandarbha, he quotes this verse. Our Acharyas give elaborate commentaries and it has many different meanings. Like the verse we're looking at today, it has a lot of similarity. The gopis, they're praying to Krishna as Bhagavan. that you're in lena naba you're you're the the personality whose navel is like a lotus flower lord bama comes out of that you're your bhagavan yogeshwarai hridiva chinchama gada bodai and all the great rishis and, and uh, mystics they worship you but who are we sansara kupa patita we're we're fallen in this sansara kupa and this this dark well of material existence we're just household ladies gay hums and some of the monastic yat sadana ha we can't uh, uh, so we're praying that let our minds be meditating on you so this is a general meaning but the gopis are also saying something else and indirectly they're telling krishna that oh please excuse us please accept our obeisance as you're a big man you left vrindavan and now you're bhagavan you're god so please accept our obeisance sir huh? and you're sending that uddhava fellow to us who's telling us that we should be yogis and we should do meditation things but we can't do meditation because sansara kupapati that we're fallen in in the ocean and the dark well of material existence we're just gay hum just and we're just absorbed in family affairs in other words you're saying we're absorbed in braj we're absorbed in you because that's the mood of braj and we can't do yoga we can't do meditation because our minds are not peaceful to practice yoga you have to have a peaceful mind but our minds are always disturbed our minds are always disturbed because we can't stop thinking about you 
So this is the kind of prayers that the gopis offer. And one commentary on this verse in the 82nd chapter is very interesting. It says that why is it that Shukadeva Goswami only gives us one verse from the gopis in that 82nd chapter? It's because there are many things the gopis said. But Shukadeva Goswami, or Sri Shuk, who's the Shuk or the parrot of Srimati Radharani, he couldn't tolerate repeating all those very, very painful things that the gopis were saying. So he just gave this one particular verse. And there's a lot of similarity between that verse and what we're looking at today. Virachitabhayam, Brishni Duryate, that the gopis here, they're praying that you please make us fearless. But the gopis are speaking in parokshava. They're saying two different things. One thing externally, but they're meaning another thing. And they're, they're actually chastising Krishna in different ways. Huh? So anyway, I, I'll, I'll stop there. Maybe I'm render Prabhu or yourself has some further comments. Shri Chana Chana Prabhu. Thank you. It's beautiful. Yeah, this was, I read this verse several times before, but this is the way you explained it. <laughs> Geham Jusham can actually refer to not necessarily material existence. It can refer to the gopis themselves. So it's like if we consider this as material existence, then this is... This is you could a spiritual level of consciousness, and this is Vraja level of consciousness. So the gopis are claiming to be in material level, but they're actually at the highest transcendental level of consciousness. Geham Jusham. Nice. You want to add something on this verse or sure, Prabhuji. Ahushchate Nalina Nabha Padara Vindam Yogeshwarai Ridhi Vichintyam Agada Bodhaihi Samsara Kupa Patitotaranava Lambham. Geham Jusham Api Manas Yudhyat Sadanaha. So, um, very beautifully, Sri Madhavananda Prabhu explained. Um, um, it's, it's very interesting verse, actually, very interesting. I would like to, if, um, if with your permission, would like to share a uh, few thoughts from Srimati Radharani's camp in the, uh, <laughs> in the leftist <laughs> mood of this verse. So Krishna Ahushchate Nalina Nabha. Nalina Nabha. Your navel is in the shape of a lotus. Or this, you are that person from whose navel a lotus springs. And from that lotus, Brahmaji appears. And we know Brahmaji is a fool. <laughs> Gopis are. <laughs> Gopis have already criticized Brahmaji enough. In Brahma Loka, if there's a daily newspaper, the flashing headlines would be that the gopis of Brindavan have criticized you today, Brahmaji. And you would probably open and you would say, well, that's a daily news. Nothing surprising about it. The gopis have criticized Brahmaji that what kind of faulty creator are you? You are uh, giving um, the Brajbasis two eyes. In the same village that Krishna has appeared, you're giving them only two eyes. And Dwarkavasis also have two eyes. And... Vaikunchavasis also have two eyes. And guess what? How many eyes Indra has? Indra has uh, thousands and thousands of eyes. For watching what? The dance of Ramba, Urvashi and Menaka. He needs thousands and thousands of eyes. And look how many eyes Brahmaji has. He himself is sitting with eight eyes. Four heads of two eyes each. Eight eyes. And what is he doing with those four pairs of eyes? He's closing and meditating. If he has to shut those eyelids, why would he even have those eyes? He's, you know, very faulty creator. And the Brajbasis are having two eyes. And the Brajgopis are also having two eyes. Instead of giving eyes on every pore of our body, he is given only two eyes. And those two eyes have eyelids, which are coming like curtains. So Krishna is standing in front of us and the eyelids are shutting. And when Krishna leaves Vrindavan, the eyelids open. What kind of creation is this? And then when Krishna is in front of us, those two eyes and the eyelids are open, then there are tears which come streaming, which uh, obstructs the vision of the form of Sri Krishna. If we were Brahmaji, we would give million eyes to the gopis in every pore of their body without eyelids and with no ashtasatvik vikar, no crying. So that we can drink through the pot of our eyes, the sweet form of Sri Krishna. So the point is Nalina Nabha. Why Nalina Nabha? Brahmaji is not very intelligent according to the gopis. And who is Krishna? Uh, Brahmaji is Param Gurudev. Because Brahmaji's father is the <laughs> lotus. And lotus father is Krishna. Because Nalina Nabha, 
from his navel comes a lotus and from the lotus comes Brahma. So if the grandson is not very intelligent, we could probably say that he got his genes from his father and from his grandfather. The gopis have, they, they have enough evidence that Brahmaji is not very intelligent. Now, one step before that, who is the father of Brahmaji in this poetic analysis? The lotus. Because from the navel comes the lotus, from lotus comes Brahma. And the lotus is also not very intelligent. Why? Because it appears from mud. <laughs> so the lotus is not very intelligent. That which comes in a dirty pool of muddy water, it can be intelligent. So the gopis are saying, the grandson Brahma is not very intelligent. His father, the lotus is not very intelligent. So therefore his father, Krishna, can never be intelligent. And this is why he sent Uddhava to talk to us. Huh? <laughs> The most intelligent Krishna, Nalina Nava. We know you. <laughs> From whose navel comes a lotus? Mm, you intelligent Krishna, we know you. Or in a rasic mood, it could be Nalina Nava. There, oh Krishna. Uh, we know the shape of your navel that the Dwarkavasis don't know. <laughs> You're always covered with your, you know, um, clothes and armor and weapons and chariots. So the Dwarkavasis don't know the shape of your navel. But we, Braja Gopis, in the groves of Vrindavan, we know that secret that they don't know. So you actually belong to us, Nalina Nava, the hidden secret. And then the Gopis are saying, Yogeshwara Ridhi Vichintya Magada Bodhai. Oh, you've been meditating. Your lotus feet is meditated upon by the, uh, the Yogis. But Krishna... Again, you're not fair to them. Yadhyapi samadhishu vidhira piparshyati natava nakagramarichim idam ichami nishamyadavachuta tadapi kripadhuta vichim krishna deva bhavantam vande. Srila Rupa Goswami Pad has sung that Krishna, we know you, the yogis are meditating on your, the tip, the effulgence coming from the tip of your toenail for millions of lifetimes, and still they don't get your mercy. So the gopis are saying, Krishna, you're a sadist. You are a sadist. That the yogis, Yogeshwara Ridivichintya Magada Bodhai, those sages who are trying to catch you in your mind, you never get into their mind. And we are trying to forget you, and you never leave. You sadist, Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> they want to catch you and you never get caught by them. And we want to let go, but you never leave. And you're also not very intelligent. Why? Because what uh, is the sadhana that is employed by the yogis? You're putting us through that same sadhana. It's like saying the cows eat grass. So let me feed my brother grass. It doesn't make sense because, you know, cow is a different species and my brother is a human. So if I'm going to give grass to a cow, I'm not going to feed my brother with grass. So, Yogeshwara Ridhi Vichintya Magada Bodhe. The yogis have to meditate. So you're giving them the grass of meditation. And we are samsara kupa patitotaranavalambham. We are in Braj. And you're giving us the same grass of meditation on you. It's not going to work. And then finally, the gopis say, Manasi Udiyat Sadanaha. Oh Krishna, may you appear, may you place your lotus feet in our mind. But where is your mind? Mora Mana Vrindavan, Manavana Eka Korijani, Manavana Eka Korijani. Chaitanya Charitamrit describes what is the mana? Of Radharani, Vrindavan. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said, my mind, my heart is in Vrindavan. Non-different. So when the gopis are saying here, Krishna, place your lotus feet. May your lotus feet appear in our mind. What does that mean? Our mind or our heart is Vrindavan. So may your lotus feet appear in Vrindavan, which means give up this Dwaraka, give up this Kurukshetra and come to Braj. This is the meaning. May your lotus feet rise in our heart. But our heart is Vrindavan. <laughs> so may your lotus feet appear in the land of Vrindavan. Give up this Dwaraka, give up this Kurukshetra and please come with us to the land of Braj. May the lotus feet of Krishna rise in the heart of the gopis, which is Braj. So in this way, very sarcastic, crooked, heartfelt um, glorification, <laughs> a hidden criticism. <laughs>
Sorry for speaking too much. Please forgive me. Beautiful. Thank you. Anandru, you would like to speak something? Yeah, just again, I, 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 it reminds me of Jagannath Puri. So many things remind me of Puri in this verse, which is a, one of the most important verses. It's spoken during the, the Rathi Atrits in Majjhilila chapter 13. Mahaprabhu is reciting this. And we, in the next chapter, we hear about Lakshmi Devi's uh, man. And in her man, Rupa Goswami in Ujjalila Mani, he discusses about how the uh, person is angry, how they chastise the other person in so many different ways, sometimes with harsh words, sometimes the gopis may even hit Krishna with a stick or something. And in the Madhulila chapter 14, it's described that Lakshmi Devi, her man, is very extraordinary. She's chastising Krishna with her opulence. And that's a very, very extraordinary thing. And I, I find it very significant, thinking about Puri, it's a little bit of a separate topic, but that she doesn't chastise Krishna with her opulence when she's at the Sri Mandir. But when Krishna leaves to go to Rathiyatra to go and see his girlfriends, and Krishna goes to the Medicha Mandir, which is representative of Vrindavan, because that's where uh, Vishwakarma originally made the deities of Jagannath Baladi Subhadra. Then Lakshmi Devi comes there and she manifests that angry mood and she chastises Jagannath there, Krishna, with, with that opulence. So it is this interesting thing that that's all that comes to my mind about this. I, I, a lot of thoughts have come to my mind though about uh, just putting the hand on the head. I'd like to raise that topic amongst the two of you. That, that's a very important point in this verse. Kara Sado Hum that Krishna's hand is just like a lotus flower. And one aspect of that is that the gopis are saying because we're burning in, in this uh, viraha agni, we're, we're burning in this fire of separation. So the lotus is something which is very, very cooling. It comes from the water. So your hand is very cooling. So you should put that hand on our head. And that by doing that, then kanta kamadam, you will fulfill our desires. You'll fulfill the desires of Cupid by, by putting this hand on our head. And again, that hand on the head is something we find many, many times in, in Vedic literature, in Vaishnava literature, uh, in uh, what's the name of the book, The Story of Rasika and uh, what is it, Rasika of Delas? Anyway, it's not coming to my mind right now. But uh, there's an interesting story there that, that when Rasika Nandaprabhu is from Rasik Mangal, uh, by Gopi Janavala Badas, a disciple of Rasikananda Prabhu. There was once one elephant who was attacking people. It was a demoniac elephant who was coming and killing the cows and different animals and killing people and horses and things. And the, everybody was afraid. They didn't know what to do. And so at that, that time, the, uh, the Muslim ruler who was there, his name was uh, Ahmed Beg. And uh, he wanted to actually criticize Rasikananda. He said, so we should take shelter of this sadhu, and he can do something. And because he's thinking to himself, what can he do? And Rasikananda understood his mood. So then he, he told his companions, you go away. And uh, then that elephant came, and Rasikananda started preaching to the elephant. And then at one point, Rasikananda put his hand on the head of the elephant. And when he put his hand on the head of the elephant, the elephant calmed down. And then Rasikananda spoke the uh, Hare Krishna mantra <laughs> into the ears of the elephant. And he gave initiation to the elephant. It became known as Gopal Das after that. So that's the nature uh, of Krishna's hand. That's the nature of the hand of the devotees, that it puts out the, the fire of material existence. It solves all of our different problems. But the gopis here, their mood is quite different. When they're praying to Krishna, they're praying that, that you put out this fire. What does it mean you put out this fire? It means that you appear before us. We want to see you. And they're speaking again in a humble way because they're thinking, oh, and, and they're, they're Bob, they're thinking, oh, now we've offended Krishna. Now he's gone away. Krishna's unhappy with us. So they begin to offer some prayers. But their prayer is not like our prayers. Their prayer is, we want to see you. And we want to see you. Why? Why? Sometimes we have this misunderstanding. We think that, that to see the Lord, that's a kind of sense gratification. It's like going to a movie or that there's a song in America when I was growing up that 
The boys watch the girls as the girls watch the boys as the world goes by. So that's the nature of the material existence. The boys are watching the girls, the girls are watching the boys, and they're getting this material pleasure. So many times we think that when the gopis are they want to see Krishna, that's also for their pleasure. But it's not exactly for their pleasure. If, if it's only for their pleasure, then as we, I, maybe we spoke about before in this session, in some recent class I was speaking, why didn't the gopis then go to Mathura? Uh, we, we, I think it was in our previous session we were mentioning how Radhanath Maharaj used to walk from Mathura to Vrindavan. It's not such a great distance. If the gopis really want to see Krishna, he's right there. They can go and they can see him. But seeing him is not the same way that we want to see him. They want to see him so they can render service. And what kind of service can we do in Mathura? It's a place of chariots and noise and, and on all these things going on. Where's, there's no... Radhakun, there's no Shamakun, there's no there's no Jamuna River there, there's no Kunjas, there's no Govardhan Hill. We need all these Udipanas, we need all these uh, supportive items to be there so that we can offer proper service to you. So when the gopis want to see the Lord, it indicates they want to render service to him in this very, very ecstatic way. So I, I see those points in this verse. So, Amarindapur, you would like to respond? Well, sure, Prabhuji. So as far as the, the hand is concerned, um, so <laughs> the, the word used is, um, um, since we are winding up, so maybe we'll just make this as the last point from my side, but then, then I would also like to hear from Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. Um, and maybe we can even continue this discussion in our next podcast if there are more discussions for this verse. Um, as far as the the um, the, con the context of Krishna's hand is concerned, so kara saroruham, saroruham means that which appears from the pond, very specifically because the word sara like sarovara means a pond. So saroruham means that it's not a field lotus, but it's a water lotus. So Krishna's hand is not just a lotus, but it is that lotus which appears from cooling water ponds. So that adds extra poetic and, and devotional mood to say that our body is burning in the fire of separation. And lotus by nature is very cooling. But that lotus which comes from the cooling water ponds definitely has more uh, prominence in, in healing <laughs> the heat. Mm. So... <laughs> so your hand, Krishna, is a lotus because it is pink, is reddish. The palms are pink, reddish. They are soft like the lotus. They are fragrant like the lotus. They are cooling like the lotus. And the nectar of the lotus is in the central part. So the nectar of the lotus of your palms is your touch. Just like the honeybee wants the nectar, which is in the middle portion of the lotus flower, your lotus palms are like a lotus flower. And in the middle portion is your blessings or your touch. So we want that. We like honeybees, like bumblebees, we want that. Um, so when the gopis are praying, kara saroruham kanta kamadam, in their spurti, they, they see that Krishna is coming and stretching his hand to touch them. <laughs> but then at that point, Krishna is saying, yes, I am ready to touch, but... Uh, you know, Do you all think that you're very qualified to get my touch? Great personalities are praying for my touch. You see Dhruva Maharaj. I'm just adding here. It's not in the discussion between Krishna and the gopis, but we see in the Bhagavatam, um, Dhruva Maharaj getting the touch of Krishna's hand. Akrura, Canto 10, chapter 38, I believe, takes 15 or 16. Akrura is praying, my Lord, please touch your lotus palms on my head. So in this way, Krishna is asking the gopis, you think you're very qualified to get my touch on your head? The gopis are saying, we may not be qualified, but you are Vrishni Dhurya. What does Vrishni Dhurya mean? In the, in the Yadu Vamsha, coming from King Yadu, uh, we see the 16th generation down is Vrishni. So, and he had many queens. Many queens. So Krishna, you have appeared in that dynasty of Maharaj Vrishni as the son of that dynasty. And look at how Vrishni was. He would touch and bless all his wives. He had many women and he would bless all of them. So we may not be qualified to get your touch, 
but you are Vrishni Dhurya. You are the son in the dynasty of King Vrishni who had many queens and he would bless all of them and protect them with his palm. So please live up to your own glory. We may not be glorious, but we depend on your glory. Or another meaning could be Vrishni Dhurya. You have appeared in the dynasty of Nanda Maharaj. Why have you appeared in the dynasty of Nanda Maharaj and not Vasudev Maharaj there, but you have appeared here, here in Brindavan, Vrishni Dhurya as the, as the son of Nanda Maharaj to display unlimited sweetness. Is it not Krishna? More sweetness than Vaikuntha, more sweetness than Dwaraka, more sweetness than Mathura. And where is the sweetness? The sweetness is not about thinking who's qualified or who's not. It's about freely distributing the nectar that you have. So please place your hand on our head. And, and in this way, you fulfill all our desires. When there is heat, traditionally it is described in, in Ayurveda that whenever there is heat, they would place lotus petals on the forehead. Just like the mother sometimes, uh, when I remember when I was a kid my, and I used to be down with fever, my mother used to dip handkerchiefs in, in uh, salt water and place handkerchiefs on the forehead because it reduces the temperature when, when someone is having fever or is down with temperature. So traditionally in Ayurveda, they keep lotus petals on the, on the head when someone has high temperature because it is described that water lotus petals, they have the power to absorb that heat. So the gopis are telling Krishna that our body is burning in the heat of separation and no lotus petal of this world will help except the lotus petal of your palms. So please kindly keep it on our head so that the heat <laughs> of our illness, the fever heat comes down. So they are giving formidable reasons why, why Krishna should come. And then to support that, they also say, um, you know, when you have Shri Karagraham, when you can give your hand to Lakshmi, and that Lakshmi has taken shelter of Braj, where we are the leaders as the gopis. If you can give your hand to Lakshmi, why can't you give your hand to the gopis? <laughs> Shri Karagraham. So in that way, the word Karasaroruham and Shri Karagraham are uh, linked with the same word Kara being used. So these are some thoughts. Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I think... Adantru, you'd like to reflect on this? I think we may have to continue this verse in our next session also. To some extent, we can do it partially, then move to the next verse. But if you have some quick reflections, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, no, I, I'm okay. I'm so, such a nice, nice comment from Amarinda. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah. So, uh, I'll try to summarize. So, this verse started about how it seems to be in the Aishwarya Bhava a lot where they're talking about Krishna being, blessing them with their hands on their head. And they're talking about Krishna being the God of the Lord, the Lord of the Goddess of Fortune, Shri, Shri Karagraham. So the understanding discussed at multiple levels. One level is that the gopis, they are setting the example for us sadhakas. Another is that they are expressing their dainyata in their desperation to call out for Krishna. And in general, in the prayers of the Vrajivasis, it is discussed that there are not that many prayers directly by the Vrajivasis to Krishna. But in the prayers, sometimes this Danyata comes up. And then we discuss that beautiful verse from the, the, the prayer that the gopis are offering to Krishna in Mathura and that in, in Kurukshetra. And that also has a very similar mood over here. And we discuss the external and internal or the left and the right meanings of those verses. And in this particular verse, this, is, this last part about Karasaro Ruham, and um, that your, it's because it's a water lotus, it's especially cooling and it's especially soothing for the heart and that you bless Lakshmi Devi, so you please bless us also. So if you're blessing her, then why can't you bless us? And the overall mood in this verse is that the gopis are as you mentioned, as we mentioned that and Krishna may feel angry and go away. So the gopis are glorifying Krishna while also beseeching him to return and give them his darshan. And um, this verse actually is, uh, is although the Aishwarya Bhav is there, the Aishwarya Bhav is actually intensifying their Madhurya call to Krishna to return. Of course, there are many other points. But thank you very much for joining today. 
and we look forward to continuing our session in the near future hare krishna